Stefan, stage is all yours. All right, cool. So um, uh, we've only got 50 minutes, as um, as he said. So I'm going to whiz through this at quite a lick. So you're, there's nothing wrong with your audio. It's just the way I'm talking. Um, so um, I'm Steve Payne. I work for DE Shaw, which is a global investment firm based in the US. And uh, PJRMI is an in-house tool that we have, which allows you to basically uh, be able to invoke uh, Java methods and so on and so forth from Python and also vice versa. So PJRMI is Python Java Remote Method Invocation. And essentially, the way it works um, in the common case is that it will create a shim object on the Python side that represents a Java object. And then you can basically just treat that shim object as if you would treat any other Python object. And it, you know, what's going on behind the scenes is essentially transparent to you. But you're actually kind of calling into uh, the Java process on the other side. Now, this isn't necessarily an original idea. Uh, there are other um, open source implementations out there. We're currently working on open sourcing PGRMI, but that's still work in progress. So if you're chomping at the bit to um, you know, have a go with something like it, there's things like JEP, which is an in-process version um, of a similar sort of thing. Py4j is probably closest to PGRMI in terms of like the general features it has. And JPy is another in-process implementation. And JEP is a, yeah, allows you to call from Java down into Python. Um, Py4j is uh, Python to Java, and JPy is, I think, you know, uh, Java down to Python as well. Um, PGRMI will go in both directions, and it yeah, pretty much has most of the features that yeah, these other guys have. So without further ado, we're going to kind of start kicking off. Um, so the way that we're going to see these examples is that we're going to go for a sort of you know, client server um, model where we have a parent child, and there's going to be a Python parent and a Java child, which we're essentially just going to drive. And um, you know, in order to actually really do anything, you're going to need handles on objects and things. And um, in some of our common use cases, we'll, you know, we have a special method that allows you to get direct you know, handles on objects called you know, get object instance, which is implemented on the Java side. But in this case, we're just going to be kind of just grabbing raw classes and monkeying with them. So let's roll. Um, so first of all, we're going to import NumPy, because of course, you have to have NumPy in pretty much any presentation. And we also import PGRMI and get an instance, which we're just going to call C, because it's quick to type. And uh, now we have our PGRMI instance. Um, with uh, you know various arguments up here, just to kind of keep it quiet and make it multi-threaded. Um, we're going to grab a couple of classes. Uh, we have now have some classes instantiated on the Python side. So let's see what we got. And you'll see here that when we sort of get it to print uh, the details of this class, it just you know, gives us a class which is namespaced within the DSHOW um, PGRMI namespace and then within its own Java namespace. And the same for the hash map. You kind of see that that's a hash map. So these are just Python classes as you would just use them generally. And so now let's actually use them. So <clears throat> first thing we're going to do is we're going to instantiate three lists. Uh, the first list is just go, going to be like standard empty one. The second list will uh, construct it using a collection of some numbers, which some people might recognize. And the third list is just going to be a regular Python list, which we're going to instantiate using one of our Java lists. And you can see here when we print them out, they kind of just look like a bunch of lists. Um, similarly for a map, um, yeah, we're going to instantiate these guys. And <clears throat> as you can see, we get the first one, which is an empty map. Second one, which is a map with like one, two, three, four, five, six. And the third one, which is a dict instantiated from that Java map um, on the, you know, as a Python object, which again is just has the same contents. Now you'll see in the example above, uh, we instantiated the Python list using a Java list, and it you know didn't really need any particular magic. Now, because the dict constructor in Python needs a set uh, kind of an iter iterable of tuples. Um, there is a little bit of syntactic sugar that PGRMI puts on the map.entry objects to allow them to be interpreted as pairs. Um, and PGRMI, for most part, it's um, just reaching into Python, sorry, reaching in from Python into Java and using reflection just to instantiate all these classes on the fly. But there are some classes that it knows a little bit about and can kind of do you know, some handy magic with. But you can kind of see here that we can use Python syntax. So we're just going to pull a value out, you know, um, one of our Java maps, which you know the value, the key uh, corresponds to the value two, the key one corresponds to two, and the index four um, in that list corresponds to the value five, because that's just the way we roll. Now things get a little bit interesting with Python and Java because they have similar type systems, but they're not exactly the same. So Python, you know, kind of only really has 
one type for floating point and integers um, outside of NumPy, that is, and come the built-in types. And whereas Java has like a whole bunch of specific types. Um, Java has method overloading, but Python doesn't. Um, and Java has also objects and primitive types of things like integers and floats and so on and so forth, whereas Python just has pretty much objects. However, Python does have NumPy, which has kind of a slightly richer type system in inside it. So we can use that when we are starting to bump into potential ambiguities, which can happen in overloading situations. So here, we're going to grab a bunch of classes from the Python uh, in Python from the Java side. And um, we're going to basically instantiate a whole load of things here. So basically, just a bunch of ranges. But <clears throat> they're going to be done in such a way as um, some will have type information, some mm -hmm. won't. And we're just going to be doing a bunch of inference here. So we're going to grab these guys, and they're now instantiated. And you can see here at the top, we instantiated a bunch of things that were just pure Python objects. And then we use them to instantiate a bunch of lists, which are actually Java lists. Now, uh, the interesting thing here that you'll know is that um, the array list just kind of took the co a constructor. Uh, sorry, the, the array list constructor just took a collection, um, which you know PJRMI was able to you know use the uh, the Python collections that it's been given and sort of turn them into ones that Java could use. And so, if we actually kind of look to see what we got, um, we print out a bunch of stuff here. You can see that uh, for the first guy. Um, it interpreted the um, the zero as a byte because because the array list under the hood is really just has a, um, a a collection of objects. PJRMI doesn't have really any type information that it can work with, so it, it basically makes its best guess. But in the second example of the list here, uh, we gave it a list of int sixty fours, which are NumPy types, and so it actually knew that these guys could be long. So even though the first value is a zero, it knew that was a long. And similarly, we kind of gave it a list of sort of small um, bytes, and we sort of pulled these things out. And the big one, which you know, turned into an int. And so PGRMI is making some type inferences under the hood. And similarly, yeah, mm -hmm. we can kind of just get direct values where we say, OK, give me the, the byte object of a, the small integer, which is 7, and that works fine. We can also say, do the same thing for an integer. Yeah, it's a small, um, yeah, it's a small number, but we can treat it as an int. But uh, in Java, if you attempt to compile code, that will cause an overflow, uh, you'll get a, a compile time error. And similarly, if we now try and instantiate a byte object by giving it an integer, PJRMI will complain at you because the value is too large to be represented as a byte. And so it will kind of have the same guarding semantics that you get with, um, with Java. So one thing, interesting thing here that you sort of can see going on is that if you kind of look back up, these values are just kind of appearing, even though these are um, Java objects, they're actually appearing as very sort of vanilla types in, in Python. And this is boxing that's going on. So we basically have taken these kind of types and sort of m we're letting them masquerade as you know, regular Python types. And we see the same with strings. So if I basically say here, OK, we're just going to get a string, and I say, give me the, the string value of this thing, it prints as this string, which just looks like a Python string, but its actual type is a special, is a special mm -hmm. box type. But that being said, you can just you know, call split on it like you would any um, Python string, because it actually inherits from the Python string type as well. Uh, and if you start taking these objects and passing these boxed objects back to the uh, Java side, Jar the PJRMI um, code will automatically figure out that these are really, Python, uh, really Java objects and correctly unbox them. So what we're about to do here is, well, is we're going to create two integers, which are going to be separate objects on the Java side. And if we call hash on these guys, we're just going to call the regular hash method, and that'll look the same. But we can use identity hash code from Java to actually kind of see what you know the, the pointer potentially is, or at least a hash of the pointer. And if we do that, we see that the integer, you know, the hashes are unsurprisingly the integer itself. But then under the hood, the identity hash code um, shows us the fact that we actually have two different pointers lurking here. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned before, is that PJRMI would attempt to turn various Python containers into the sort of similar ones on the um, Java side. And we've seen this working with ArrayList. Um, but you can also just use it with arrays. We also saw it with Dix above as well. So here in the arrays class, there's a method called asList, which takes, um, as you can see here, in the type signature, it takes a, an array of Java objects. And so 
we have our uh, list, our NumPy um, A range of int 64s, and we can actually just pass this to arrays as list, and this will give us back a uh, a list object from the Java side, which we can just see. You know, we print it out. It's just a list, and so there can, there's a lot of sort of type you know coercing that's going on under the hood between Java and Python by PGRMI in order to uh, allow you to have very sort of natural communication between the two languages. And similarly, you can just go the other way. So we can just um, you know, tell a tuple, hey, here's this list that we have from the um, Java side, and you can use it to instantiate a tuple object as well. OK. Now, I also mentioned um, function overloading. Um, so the ArrayList uh, class has a, a method called add. And what we're going to do here, we're going to just take a quick look. And we're sort of told that signature actually comes in two forms. So add can either take just an object, or it can take an integer and an object, where the integer is the offset at which you want to add. So it's basically allows you to do insertion within the middle of the list and things. And so here we go. We'll print out our list of in64s, which is our Java object. And we're going to append something to it. And that seemed to work, because we got back a true. And we're going to um, stick something at the start. and and let's print it out. And whoa, now this is kind of fun because we have what well, looks like a string and then a bunch of numbers and then another string. And so we can do that? Well, yeah, we can because um, ArrayList isn't really sort of like strongly typed. The generics that Java uses um, are just a compile time um, thing. They're kind of a sugar that you get at compile time. And type erasure means that at runtime, none of that is really enforced. And so an array list is just a collection of objects. And so you can stuff into it whatever you want. And so if we actually look at the types of all of these things, we will see that at the end and the beginning, we have stuffed in strings into this list. And so you can basically you know, do the same thing with Java that you can do with Python, and you can stuff any old thing into a list, and it can be happy. But be very careful if you then you know, pass this thing into a function which takes a list of longs because you will get runtime you know, class casting errors. Um, but speaking of errors, um, exceptions in PGRMI work in the same way that you would kind of expect them to work in Python. So here we have that list, and we know it's about 10 elements long. And we're going to try and get the, the zeroth element and then get the 1,000th element. And unsurprisingly, um, we said something went wrong because we got an exception thrown. And here we see that we have the Java exception with its stack trace and everything. <clears throat> so exceptions are basically similar. And you see we, we were just catching an exception here. And it was the index out of bounds exception. But now we're still going to get a little bit more fancy. So um, we have our map that we created above. And we have the computive absent method, um, which you know, is a Java method, standard method in the maps in the JDK these days. And as its second argument, it takes a lambda operation which allows you allows the, the map code to compute the, the value if the key is not present, you know, if the key is not present in it. And so we're actually going to do this by passing in a Python lambda. And we call it. The map was previously empty. We called it, we got back the 11, and we printed out, and lo and behold, yep, yeah, we called the um the compute if absent method with 10. It computed 11 as the appropriate value and stuffed it in. So what's actually going on here? Now this is where it gets a little bit interesting because uh, this is um, why I had to put in the num workers argument right at the top because we had to make the system multi-threaded because now Java is having to call back into Python and Python has to have threads sitting there ready to receive these callbacks because you know, the method you're calling um, you know, from the Python side, you know, Python's just going to be waiting on that recall you know, to come back and so there have to be threads working to help out and similarly on the Java side there will also be threads and now we can actually go a little bit bonkers here. And um, so we're going to use computer if absent with a lambda you know, on one map, which is going to call computer if absent on another map, which is then going to call another lambda, which is going to be calling back and forth. And so we're kind of going from Java into Python, then Python back into Java, and then Java back back into Python, which is then going to call back 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 into Java. So this is getting kind of crazy, but let's just see if it actually works. Oh, the moment of truth. Yes. So you can see here that you know, previously we had 10 and 11 in that map, and now we have you know, 100 mapping to 51. Um, so that kind of works. So it's always good when the crazy things work for you in a, in a live demonstration. And um, finally, um, you know, similarly, uh, Python um, you know, has duck typing. And so uh, we, we have interface you know, class, well, interfaces on the Java side, and we can you know, exploit the duck typing 
from uh, Python to actually pass in something which looks like a Java interface, provided it implements the right types. So here we're going to create something which looks like a Java runnable, and we're going to call it Python runnable, and it's going to have one method, and it says, you know, I ran when you run it. So hurrah, that works. And so now we're going to create a Java thread and pass it the Python runnable and let it roll. And lo and behold, that thread starts, and it calls a method which says I ran, which is calling back into um, you know, uh, Python from the Java side once again. But here, we're just passing in essentially a duct type interface. And that's pretty much all you need to do, apart from just giving it the right proxy um, you know, base class to inherit from, which implements a bunch of the methods that you know, the thing needs to run. And that's pretty much it. I mean, you can also do a couple of other things, like you know, if we have a the map, you know, here we have map one sitting on the Java side. We can actually kind of essentially do a copy by value and, and pull back a local copy, um, which you know is just the the Python type, um, but is the the Python representation. And this is essentially just using cpickle under the hood. So we take the Java object, we render it as a cpickle on the local Java side. And then give it to Python, which knows how to you know, turn that back into a, you know, a regular thing. And then finally, at the end of all of this, we have just a very sort of cheesy random script, which I just threw up, uh, threw together. And yeah, this is often a way that we'll be using PJRMI you know, within the company, where you create a script that's mostly being driven um, you know, by Python, but is allowing uh, Py you know, Java to do all the heavy lifting for it. And so here. We're going to get our script. It's not doing anything particularly exciting, but it just prints out numbers and you know it has some apples and that sort of thing. And so that was a very seat of the pants, quick introduction to PGRMI. Um, hopefully, as I say, um, we'll have it open sourced at some point. And um, but uh, in the meantime, if you yeah you know, while you're waiting for that, you can use things like Py4j. But you know, watch this space. And thanks for your time. Awesome, Stefan. We have a question from the audience. Let me just quickly, quickly put it on the banner. Yeah. Do we have an API doc uh, for PJRMI? Um, so uh, it's yeah, it's not a public thing yet, and so this is all kind of within the company. But the um, yeah, the API in, in itself is actually like fairly well documented locally. So once it's open source, it should all be kind of out there. But um, at the end of the day. You know, a lot of what you sort of you know saw here covers mm -hmm. kind of most of the basics of the thing, uh, and pretty much all you need to know. And as I say, it creates um, all of the Python types on the fly. So apart from the old bit of sugar that it adds to a few classes here and there, uh, and you know some of the boxing it does for the local types, essentially the API you get from the um, the Java class, you know, the API that Java classes have is the one that you get locally on the Python side. We have another question. What would be an actual use case where I would definitely need this information? Um, so we actually use this for uh, like a whole bunch of things. Um, uh, one you know, use case which is very handy is on-the-fly debugging because you can like literally attach to a running Java process and then just start making calls within it. You know, it's all running in a separate thread, so you have to kind of worry about thread safety and that sort of thing. But it can be very, very useful for going into a live process and kind of monkeying around with it. Um, we also use it in cases where, you know, because within the company we have a lot of infrastructure built in Python, sorry, in Java that's doing essentially like a lot of heavy lifting work, which just isn't feasible to do in languages like Python. And we'll, but you know, Java is not a scripting language. You know, if you try and write something that looks like a script in Java, it just ends up as a complete mess. And this is kind of why PJRMI, PJRMI was invented in the first place within the company was because we kind of had scripty like stuff in Java and we just wanted to have something much better on the front end to drive it with. And so essentially a lot of these use cases are when you have big infrastructure within um, uh, Java that you potentially want to drive from Python. And similarly, you might, for instance, have like a big heavyweight system um, but that somebody wants to interface with from the Python side. And then it's a very sort of simple glue language because you literally just like connect to the Java process and just make calls on it. So we use it quite heavily for various things. Oh, you've gone quiet. I can't hear you. 
Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, is it possible to call into Python from Java example to implement workflow steps in Python? Uh, yes. <clears throat> so, um, so what we saw here was the the, the basic case of um, you know a Python parent spawning a Java child, but it is possible to go in the other other direction and have a Java process spawn a Python child process, and then for Java to call down into it. And we actually have you know code that you know will work in both directions, um, and that's quite a common use case too. Another question is, how do you tell Java where to find the Python APIs? Well, um, you really like the Java side has to know um, what it's calling. So the Java side will just effectively have embedded Python in it if you're calling down into Python from Java. And so the Java side isn't, isn't doing what the Python side is doing, essentially. It's not kind of creating shim classes on the fly. But you can you know, call directly down into um, Python from Java. And then when you call a method, you, you know, the arguments you pass in will be like Java classes and, that, you know, and types and that sort of thing. And the results that you get back will be transformed in the same way. Why not Jython? Ah, uh, so. Yeah, Jython, Jython's great, except um, it doesn't play very well with things like NumPy and that sort of thing. And like any C extensions make it really tricky. So um, it it would be it would be great. It really would if you could just kind of run everything in the same VM. Um, but there's a lot of kind of hokey stuff that goes on there. Also, uh, Jython has a different threading model to Python, where you know because Python has the gil, whereas Jython is actually like you know, in a way, properly multi-threaded. And so there's probably a lot of code that, you know, plays it fast and loose with threads and the lack of locking and relies on the gill, um, which would break pretty heavily. So I honestly would love to be able to use Jython, but I think it's main, um, the main uh, barrier to entry there is the fact that it just doesn't play nicely with C extensions because it's, a, you know, just not compatible. Great, that was great, Stefan. And uh, especially thanking you because the show is also the platinum sponsor of PyCon India 2020. And another similar announcement that I would want to make for the attendees that DE Shaw is hosting a knowledge sharing event at the expo booth. So head there, there are some exciting gifts to grab. All you have to do is to share about what Python libraries or framework that you're using and that intrigue you. And uh, for Stefan, I just want to tell you that there are a lot of people in the comments that appreciate if you make this uh, thing open source, and they would love to contribute. So very exciting thing that you have here. Yeah, we're, we're working on it, but it's it's one of those things where it, it's quite you know it, it uses a lot of code with, you know within the, the company, and so it's like extracting it from that without kind of um, breaking all of its functionality is is the fun bit. So, but we're working on it. Great. Thanks a lot, Stefan, for making it. Uh, so late, given your time zone. Sure. Any closing words? Um, sure. So I'll probably be around for another 15 minutes or so on the um, the 2020 Stage Delhi um, thing. Um, but then I'm going to go to bed because it is 2 a.m. <laughs> so. Thanks a lot, Stefan. And uh, have a good night. All right. Thanks very much. Take care. Bye-bye.